Hey everybody, welcome back to the Storytime channel. My name is Steven, and let's get into our stories of the day. Trick me? Claim all of my work for you and your slackers? Watch it backfire. My first time posting here, my brother got into talking about bad work experiences and told us this story. Cast. Sam, my big brother. Lazy slackers. Boss. Big boss. VP. Me. Small background. My brother was working at an at-will employer in charge of making small commercials for local and, very rarely, state companies slash businesses. Think of a small airplane hangar with 60-ish employees and a studio apartment for the higher-ups. The setup. My brother was a gopher for his lazy manager and his four slacker employees. His usual job was all of their work while they were out of the office going to bars and strip clubs. My brother was told that they were going to important business meetings during all these times. And one day he got a text from our mom and dad that said with pictures, hey, we found your manager and co-workers at the strip club. When he got this text, he checked the company work records and saw that they had all taken credit for his work and left his name out of it. The boss came down to his section of the office and told them that he was being reprimanded for not doing any work for the past month. He was told in an email that he was on an unpaid suspension for the next month with the big boss and VP CC'd in the email. Cue the malicious compliance. My brother and his team were to oversee a multi-million, three million or so, contract commercial for a company that was to be in the Super Bowl 2016. Can you see where this is going? My brother, knowing that he was going to be blamed for the fallout, put in his immediate resignation two weeks after his suspension. On week four, I'm with my brother in the car eating Sonic and he gets a phone call from a frantic boss asking where he is. My brother said, I'm in my car next to my little brother eating at Sonic. He started to cuss and shouted him to get back to the office when my brother chimed in with, if I'm so useless at work, I'm sure lazy and slackers can do it all right. It's not like they're currently at the local strip club every time they say that they're going to a business meeting, right? And I put in my resignation two weeks ago, remember? There was a 10 second pause in the call. If you want to talk to him about it, go to the club and ask him yourself. My brother gets a four way call the next day from the boss, big boss and VP all apologizing and asking him to get back to work immediately to which he responded with, as I have told boss and big boss, I put my immediate resignation in two weeks ago with Big Boss's signature on it. VP said, I wasn't aware of this. My brother continues, Since I haven't done anything in the past month, I'm sure Lazy and the Slackers can do it all right. It was then they realized they screwed themselves over a false report from Lazy. A month later, he gets a call from an ex-coworker saying that the big company sued the company into bankruptcy and let go of everyone. Lazy and the slackers were fired only two days after the four-way call. Karma is a witch. Obviously, you wouldn't want to return to working full-time for a place that treated you so badly and blindly went with a false report without looking into it. But at least for this one job, you probably could have come back and got a nice pay bump from it. If that was the case, despite knowing the flaws that were present, would you have done it? Let me know in the comment section down below. Secure it, but leave the keys in it. Roger that, LT. This happened back in my army days on deployment to Afghanistan. I was an E4 despite being in for around 7 years at this point because I decided to self-medicate for a while before seeking help for PTSD and was a bit of a fixture in my unit after spending my entire army career in this unit. Despite my freakups, I was well liked by most of my unit, and especially by my CO, company commander, and first SG, first sergeant, the enlisted counterpart to the CO. I was what the army calls a deployment soldier. Someone who you love to have in your unit while deployed, but gets a bit, let's say, distracted and has a tendency to get into a bit of trouble when back in garrison, or the US, for too long. I was known for being sarcastic, a jokester, and hardworking when it mattered, but tended to be the typical long-term E4 when it came to bold duties in garrison. 
For instance, taking a three-month staycation when our OH base defense duty. But that's a story for another time. Also important to the story, I was also known for rarely being seen without my best friend, Jay, who I went to basic with and was lucky enough to be in the same unit my entire career. And if we were left without supervision for too long, well, leadership knew not to let that happen. Consequences could range from the time the entirety of the barracks living members of the company missed PT the day after St. Patrick's Day, due to the three-story beer bong monstrosity we created to, well, this story. To the story. I had recently been switched to ops, operations. Basically, they put me behind a desk to be the armorer, guy that makes the pew pews go pew again when they stop pewing. From the front line, despite having no training and definitely not the best person for the job. This led to me being the lone person on the night shift as troops tend to take very good care of their weapons when downrange, and if something does break it, it usually has to go to battalion armorers, the guys that were actually trained to fix them. So honestly, there wasn't much for me to do. I won't get into all of my duties, but it wasn't much, it wasn't hard, and I was bored. Cute side note, the best nights were when the mind dog assigned to us couldn't sleep and came to the TOC, Tactical Operations Center, and I got to play with her most of the night. Back to the story. Before I switched, Jay was in the lead vehicle which had an IED. He was medevaced out on a chopper, but luckily himself and two others were concussed and beaten up, but otherwise okay. Rest in peace to the driver, sadly. He was only 19 and was placed on life support, but it was removed at the request of his parents less than 24 hours later. Anyway, Jay came back to the unit, but leadership was wary of sending him back on a mission too soon, and he was placed on night shift with me. To this day, even the CO and his PL, platoon leader, usually a second lieutenant aka Butterbar, can't explain why they thought putting he and I together on night shift, unsupervised, for 12 hours a night was a good idea. With both of us being well liked and in our specific company for longer than anyone else there, we got pretty brave and there were quite a few antics and pranks pulled on the company leadership, most of which were tolerated and laughed about, and I can go into detail later if anyone is interested. This antic, however, was not loved by the officers. Not at all. While deployed, military cooks serve midnight chow, which is exactly what it sounds like. Since we were on a larger base this time around, our unit was issued a gator. Think electric golf, except where the rear seat and club holders would be, there's a small dump truck bed. We would use this to drive to pick up midnight chow and drive back. And sometimes other members of the unit would use it for work or just to avoid taking the buses on base. Well, one particular morning, a group of lower enlisted took it to the gym and stayed longer than usual. And when the officers woke up, they wanted to go get breakfast, only to find they had to use the bus because the gator was gone. Jay and I were berated and told that we weren't supposed to let anyone below a platoon sergeant rank use the gator. First we'd heard of the rule, but whatever, this happens all the time in the army, adjust and move on. Since we were ops, we were still allowed gator use, so we didn't care. That is, until one morning I left shift with the gator key still in my pocket and they couldn't find them or use the gator until I showed up for my next shift. Thus ends the gator use for anyone but the first sergeant, who never used it anyway. The CO and the XO, second in command to the CO on the officer side. Usually a first lieutenant, but in this case a butter bar. Our exact orders were... The key stay in the gator and no one uses it without our permission. And I was told off pretty harshly by the XO. Usually you can get away with a bit argument with a butter bar. The good ones anyway, after you've been in the military for a while. And this XO really was a good one. I guess he was just having a bad day or something, I don't know. But I knew better than to press my luck and argue. There's more than one way to break in a new LT, after all. So now we finally come to the malicious compliance. Jay and I were fairly annoyed with the XO's actions, 
and since we had nothing better to do that night, and I sure as heck wasn't gonna let him think his rank allows him to not give people decent human respect, we spent the first few hours thinking of how to teach him a lesson. Knowing the CO had left to the brigade headquarters earlier that day, we came to the conclusion that since we couldn't bring the key inside anymore, but still needed to secure the gator, we'd need to get creative. That night, we decided that since we had to be inside and couldn't have eyes on it, we'd need to hide it, or at least place it out of reach. Outside on a smoke break, we saw connexes, or railroad containers for civilian speak. They were stacked too high, with empties on top and extra supplies on bottom. We looked at each other and immediately knew what to do. We took turns building a makeshift ramp that night and slowly eased the gator up to the top of one of the stacks, turned it off, left the keys in, and disassembled the ramp. Luckily, we left before the XO woke up, and the first sergeant didn't notice it was missing since he never used it. Getting back that night, we were a bit nervous, but when we walked in, the first sergeant tried hard to hide a smile. We knew we were in the clear then. Sure enough, the XO comes to us with a red face. XO says, What the heck was that? What was what, sir? Don't give me that shoot, the gator. Well, sir, you said we had to keep the gator secure from anyone without your permission. But we have to stay inside and couldn't see it. Since we had to leave the keys in it as well and didn't have any guidance, we thought the best thing would be to put it where no one can reach it. This is the point the first sergeant breaks down laughing and the XO knows nothing will happen to us. So he says, Okay, that was good. You had your fun, but don't put it back up there again. Roger, sir. We later found out they used a crane from the contractors to get it down. Probably for the best, no one got hurt that way. Still under the same orders with one caveat, and inspired by the crane usage, that night I took a trip to the contractors and... After explaining the situation to them, they happily agreed to use the crane to move a barrier from our mortar bunker out of the way long enough for us to fit the gator in, then replaced it. There was physically no way to get it out without a crane. Things happened much the same that night. Except this time we had new orders that we were not to hide the gator at all. The first sergeant stayed behind that night for a few smokes with Jay and I, laughing but telling us he can't protect us forever, but he was interested in seeing how it all plays out so he wouldn't stop us from continuing, but tread carefully. We thanked him and quickly came up with our new plan, but this time waited until about 3am thinking the XO may have a surprise visit. Sure enough, around 1 we saw a red flashlight beam shine on the gator during a smoke break, and while we can't prove it was the XO, we assume it was. Around 3, we began unscrewing the entire front wall of the TOC, drove the gator inside, and replaced the wall. That morning, the XO unexpectedly arrives with the first sergeant before we were off shift. The first sergeant walks in and laughs so hard he can't breathe. Hearing a loud sigh outside the door, the XO enters, stares at our work, and walks out, head down, without saying a word. This time, the first sergeant made us undo our work since it would interfere with operations, and later that night, the XO told us we'd made our point and we even got an apology. After that, anyone could use the gator as long as it was back by breakfast, and the CO had one heck of a laugh when he returned. You give a couple of best friends way too much time and include some boredom into it, and you'd be surprised what stuff you can pull off. Just make whatever the customer asks for. I used to work in a run-of-the-mill pub behind the bar. Choices were three out of four ales that changed regularly, one beer and two lagers on tap. This all changed when the owners decided cocktails are the big thing, and suddenly the two bottles of whiskey, two gins and a vodka behind me, become a huge array of spirits of all kinds and flavors, with a fridge stocked with fruit juices and all sorts. The boss was right, and the new cocktail menu proves very popular. This alongside a bit of a makeover sees the pub getting a lot busier than usual. I've got nothing against the pub being busy, but it takes a lot longer to make a cocktail than pour a pint, 
or a vodka and coke. On top of that, the menu is very extensive and I don't know the names of the drinks, so I'm constantly referring to the menu to make the drinks ordered. My slowness is not acceptable to the boss and when it is clear I'm not going to learn 50 plus cocktails in a weekend, I'm instructed to just ask the customer what's in the drink they're ordering as this is quicker than looking it up in the menu. I do so but still check the menu when I'm suspicious that a cheeky customer is upping the alcohol content saying doubles when the measures should be single for example. I'm caught doing exactly this and I am berated by my boss in front of a busy bar for checking the menu when there is a queue. Here's the malicious compliance. I start making the cocktails exactly as instructed to by the customers. Long Island iced tea. Two double vodkas in there? No problem. Mississippi mud pie. Has both the Irish creams in? Okay. Purple rain. With all five of the sour spirits in? Here you go. I make whatever I'm told to. This lasted all of a week before the boss saw what was happening and allowed me to check the menu again. The customer is always right, but if you give the customer too much power, they'll probably just take advantage of you. But with that being said, that's all the stories we have for today. So what I want to know is, which of these stories was your personal favorite of the day and why? Let me know which story and why in the comments section down below. And thank you all so very much for watching and listening to the Storytime channel today. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and don't forget to turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video from the Storytime channel. Thank you all again so very much for watching and listening to the Storytime channel.